Hi, I'm Stacy, self-taught meal master, and welcome to my new mini-series, Hot Girl Summer. Why? Well, A, it's hot, B, it's summer, and C, I've got some new grill toys to play with. Today, I'm going to be throwing you a backyard party, and I'm gonna make some great grilled appetizers and show you how easy it is. So, being a Philly girl, we're gonna make a Philly cheesesteak crostini. We're also gonna make a white pizza with grilled veggies and a beautiful arugula prosciutto salad to put over top, and then we're gonna wash it all down with a watermelon prosé. <laughs> So first we're going to start with a crostini. You know, I lived in Philly and near Philly almost my entire life, so the quintessential thing to eat is a cheesesteak, but how do you do it for an outdoor party? You make it a little bit fancy. And the base of this is really some really rich flavors like roasted garlic and caramelized onions. And while I think a lot of people know how to do those two things on their stovetop and in their oven, they don't realize how easy it is to do on your outdoor grill. So what we're gonna do is cut the top of the garlic bulb off and you're gonna take a piece of tin foil and you're gonna set this on top. And so since I have two, let me do the other. Then we're gonna drizzle this with a little bit of olive oil over top and we're gonna wrap this up, maybe some salt and pepper if you want. Um, I always go the s &P. About a couple tablespoons. That's all it's gonna take. Some salt, some pepper. And honestly, you're just gonna wrap this up nice and tight into like a little bowl. All right, next up, caramelized onions. Again, so easy to do on the grill. In this case, I love sweet onions, are probably my favorite, like a Walla Walla or Vidalia. But honestly, you can use a red onion, you could use shallots. If you're using shallots, you're gonna need a lot of them, probably eight or nine. In this case, with a Vidalia onion, maybe three large onions. And I like to have them sliced very thin. They break down more easily, so about a quarter of an inch thick is all you need. And it's going to make a lot. Again, we're not gonna use all these onions for the crostini, but we're gonna save them later. You can freeze caramelized onions to use down the road or refrigerate them, and again, build them on top of burgers and sandwiches and all kinds of things throughout the week. It just brings an amazing mommy type rich flavor uh, that's awesome. So with these already pre-sliced, I went ahead and did my homework ahead of time. We're gonna add them to a cast iron skillet. A lot of people don't know, just take your regular cast iron skillets that you might already have. You can throw them right on top of your grill. So you're gonna need a large one with all this uh, kind of onion, which will really break down in size once you cook it. Two tablespoons of butter is about all you need, and I always like to do a butter-olive oil mix. It's totally your jam if you just wanna do straight butter. You know, caramelized onions, the trick is you really want them dark to get super buttery and rich. Some people stop at 20 minutes, they see them golden brown. Keep going! It's not long enough. This is easily gonna be 30, sometimes 45 minutes. You don't wanna walk away. This is also something you wanna babysit because you don't want to overcook them because that's when they can get burnt and crisp and almost turn out bitter. So we've got our roasted garlic, we've got our onions in our pan ready to go. So let's go ahead and throw these babies into the grill. All right. Okay, so if you're doing this on a regular grill, your cast iron pan is gonna protect the onions from the direct heat. So you're just gonna put it on a medium high, you're gonna let it caramelize. This is the uni pizza oven, which is awesome because it does more than pizza. So you can roast everything and you can caramelize your onions. As you see, I already had the roasted garlic in there uh, cooking. So just kind of set it off to the side, not totally directly near the flame. And we're just gonna babysit this again, 30, 45 minutes. So here's the roasted garlic, which I let cool because obviously I'm touching it with my bare hands, but I want to show you what you want this to look like. Like this is how you know you've roasted it long enough. So you can see the skin has kind of gotten very papery thin and how beautiful and brown. Oh, I gotta tell you, roasted garlic is like the best scent. They need to make a men's cologne just called roasted garlic. <laughs> Guys, petition perfume companies to make roasted garlic. You will never be dateless again. I'm just, I'm just telling you, so. 
Huh? Get your brother and your husband. Oh my God, he finally gets some action. <laughs> My poor, poor husband. Okay, so um, so what you're gonna do is you're just gonna pop these out, and that's a really nice thing. Like they just literally the cloves pop right out. Here's a fun kind of trick that um, I learned. So obviously we're gonna mix this up with butter, and it's easier to mix if it's softened butter, right? Butter's room temperature. I don't know about you, but I never can plan ahead, and when I get to the stage, I'm like, oh my God, the butter is still literally in the refrigerator, and I can't pop in the microwave because I don't want it to get melted. So here's a trick. Take your cold stick of butter out of your refrigerator, put it into the small of your back, and within 10 minutes of you doing all your other prep work, this is gonna be, look at that, nice and softened. So we're making a compound butter. You want at least a stick. Um, if you like it really garlicky, garlicky, garlicky. If you like it really gar garlicky, you're going to use maybe the whole garlic bulb. Um, if you like just a hint of garlic, again, six cloves is what I call for in this recipe to kind of be like that medium Goldilocks safe space with a stick of butter. And you're really just gonna mash this together. All right, that's good. All right, let me get some uh, cellophane here. Is it cellophane? Is it saran wrap? What's, what's, is cellophane like an ancient phrase anymore? Oh yeah, because saran's not sponsoring this episode and that's a brand name, so we'll call it plastic wrap. Oh look, it even says it on here on the box. Plastic wrap, don't we love that? Okay, and so literally like I just take it and make a lot. And that way, if you're making compound butter ahead of time, this is kind of how I would store it. And I would just kind of. So you know how I said they should make a um, men's cologne called roasted garlic? I think they should make a home fragrance called caramelized onions. It just absolutely smells amazing. And here's what I'm talking about with the whole let it go 30, maybe even 45 minutes. Don't stop at 20. Look at how just nice, deep and dark brown. Those are really silky um, in texture and they're just awesome. I put them in a separate bowl out of the cast iron pan because the last thing you need to do with caramelized onions is give it a little tang and you do that with about a tablespoon or two of balsamic vinegar depending on how many um, onions you used. Um, I don't like to do that in the cast iron and again there could be a whole debate about whether this is true or not but if it ain't broke, don't fix it rule for me, is I don't like to put acidic foods like tomatoes and this is vinegar, which is an acid, into cast iron uh, skillets or pot or, or cast iron skillets, yeah. <laughs> so I just put the caramelized uh, onions in a separate bowl. You could put um, your onions in an airtight container if you made a big bunch. Do this step in that and then you can just, whatever you're not using, uh, toss the onions in the refrigerator. They'll keep, honestly, um, a couple of weeks and again in the freezer a couple of months. All right, so if you're in Philly and you're going to eat a cheesesteak, you're gonna eat it on an Amoroso roll, right? But we're getting a little fancy, so instead of an Amoroso roll, we're gonna use a baguette. So a regular French baguette. Um, all I do is I slice it really thin, I went ahead and did that, um, maybe like, I don't know, half an inch thin. That way, if it's too thick, it'll be harder to get like a nice, quick, crisp on the grill with it the thinner the better because we just literally want to throw this on the grill for like a hot second just to give it a little bit of um, kind of like a toast to it. But we're going to take the compound butter and simply you're going to just butter one side and put a schmear. Like if you're a big bagel and cream cheese person, that's what you're going to do. Schmear on one side. So now I have a couple pieces. Grab a tray. and. We're gonna put these babies on there. We're gonna sear the steak. And then we're gonna be done. Again, the uni does bread, so I'm actually gonna crisp and toast the crostini in the uni. If you are doing this though on a regular grill, just remember butter side down. This doesn't have the open grates, so I'm gonna do it in the uni, butter side up. You know, tomato, tomato. <laughs> Again, I don't want to get it too close to the flame. It just needs the indirect heat, and it's still going to make a nice crisp mark. 
All right, so that didn't take long at all. I went ahead and I removed the crostini and I just put my cheese of choice on top. Now I'm gonna pop them back inside literally for like 10 to 20 seconds. Although I think the heat index today is 103 degrees. The cheese is already melted. I don't even need the oven. So now is the perfect time to season the steak. This recipe, I call for about a pound of either skirt or flank steak. I love this because A, you can use a cheaper type of meat. Yes, nothing fancy here, don't waste the money. But also because the skirt or the flank have a lot of fat content, which really just reminds me of the grizzle of the meat in the cheesesteaks that I would eat at 2, 3 a.m. after the bar was in Philadelphia. So it's very nostalgic for me, but anyway. So um, here I, I'm doing a half portion because uh, even though I have a crew here working with me, they're not getting fed, just so good, okay? <laughs> I know, right? I'm mean, I'm mean, they, they do not like me. Okay, and all we're gonna do, season this with olive oil, salt and pepper. I'm gonna do this on both sides, because we're grilling both sides and this is gonna be perfect. Again, high heat on the grill. We're using the pizza oven from Uni um, because it's awesome. While that pizza oven obviously is made to do pizzas, it also has um, controls so you can roast meat, you can roast fish, you can bake bread. I guess there's, there's no bread fans in here? Okay, all right, good, because I'm a terrible baker, so I'm off the hook. All right, so now I'm gonna go ahead and set this aside. Here's the other thing with me, and there's a lot of debate about this, but I'm of the rule, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. I think your steak should come to room temperature. Do not like throwing a really cold steak onto a grill. It's like if you ever stepped out in like 30 degree weather, you know how your body seizes up, you're not ready for it, same thing with me. So about 20 minutes room temperature before you're gonna throw this on the grill. So it's not a lot to ask, but it really makes a difference. All right, time for the skirt steak. Um, I like medium rare, so literally this is gonna take about two minutes. This sucker is so hot. And we're looking at a temperature about 125 degrees because we're gonna pull it out and let it rest and then it'll get up to the perfect like 130 for medium rare. All right, so I cooked it two minutes um, on one side, flipped it two minutes another. This baby's ready to go. Aha, sizzle, sizzle, hot girl summer. Okay, the steak got perfectly done. So now what we're gonna do is go ahead and cut it against the grain. I'll say that again, against the grain. If you actually cut along the lines of the steak and go with the grain, that's actually gonna make your skirt steak or if you're using plant steak, very chewy. See, it gets a bad rap because people think it's a really tough steak. It's probably just because you didn't cut it right. And what's against the grain? It's just going opposite the lines of the steak. So here, we're gonna cut it into nice thin slices, nothing too thick, because remember, this is finger food, this is appetizers. People don't wanna, you know, look like a fool trying to eat their food. And you can see, see, this is what I love. Perfectly cooked steak, that nice medium rare at about 135 degrees. If you want it medium, take it to 140, 145 degrees. And obviously, yes, you could use a fork, but I'm gonna have a lot of dishes to do today, so my tongs are a nice little stand-in. Okay, now we get to build. I'm so excited, okay. Y'all hungry? I think I'll feed you, you worked hard enough. Okay, okay, so uh, really good. I will use a fork now, though. Okay, so we have our steak here on the side. We have our crostini, we have the caramelized onions, and then we're going to top it off with a little shishi fufu of parsley oil, which is really just taking olive oil and adding some chopped parsley to it and letting it sit around for a couple of hours and it builds a nice herby flavor. So here, you're gonna start, you have the melted cheese. American is totally the way I think you have to go, though, I don't know. Anybody like Philly cheesesteak provolone here? Cheese whiz. What? Oh my gosh. Oh, now that is definitely after bar food. Like that is old school. Yeah, okay. So um, you're gonna start with your caramelized onions first and put that on and then go in with a little bit of the steak. Usually I think two strips here are just fine. Um, I like to get the, the most even in size strips for each piece. And then here's the bougie bougie parsley oil. And this is just to give it a little green color and over top. 
Let's do one more because you may have missed it, right? <laughs> so caramelized onions on top of our melted cheese on the garlic bread crostini. And that, my friends, is how you do get bougie with a Philly cheesesteak. <laughs> so really, what's a backyard party without a little beverage and cocktail? So time for our quickie cocktail. And it's a watermelon frosé. When it's really sticking hot out, the last thing I want is a glass of wine or a beer going too warm too quickly. So frosé is basically a fancy slushy made with wine. So you're gonna take one standard bottle of rosé. Key here, pick the darker colored rosé. I had my husband go out and pick this up for me and he did not listen, so. But the darker color just looks prettier. It doesn't affect. It could be whatever is your favorite rosé. You're going to pour that bottle into a 13 by nine sheet pan. It will fit, it will not overflow. You just need the space in the freezer. If you don't have the, spray, the space, excuse me, you're just going to throw um, the rosé into ice cube trays. And here's the key. This has been sitting out under our studio lights, um, so it's a little slushy, but it will not freeze solid because of the alcohol that's in here. So just take a spatula, and we're gonna get this in. And then for the watermelon, just cut up a watermelon, or do what I do, store-bought swap, get the pre-cut fresh watermelon. Um, you could use frozen, but I advise against it just because I think the flavor won't be as nice. But it's summertime, so you should have plenty of great um, in-season watermelon, maybe from the farmer's market to use. And just make sure it's seedless. Now, if you're using a Vitamix like I'm using, you can actually keep the seeds on because you know how the sucker just pulverizes everything. Um, I cut the watermelon up into two inch pieces and I freeze that. So the rosé, you'll freeze at least four hours or do it overnight. Um, you can actually do it a week in advance. The watermelon, the same thing. And I actually like throw in about six cups of watermelon. I don't do it all at once. I kind of baby step this because sometimes the Vitamix, it's so powerful that when it turns this into a slushy, it can get stuck. And here we go. Awesome. Now, if you like sweeter drinks, and in summertime I tend to like those, I add in a little simple syrup. What's simple syrup? It's simple. It's half a cup of water, half a cup of white sugar, put it in a saucepan on your stove top, get it to a light boil, turn the heat off, let it sit and cool, you have simple syrup. And you don't just use this for cocktails, pour it on fruit, ice cream over bread, maybe an ounce or two to start off, add in a little bit more of your watermelon, and you're gonna build this beautiful color, this really sweet flavor, and it's just an awesome, awesome drink. All right, I like to pour this. You could do any kind of glass. I kind of like the short highball glasses. And all you're going to do is pour that in the cup. Look at that. A frozen delight. A little garnish of, oops, where's the slit? I could have swore there was a slit. There's no slit in that one. That also doesn't sound correct. There you go. Thanks, Chef Karen, everybody. Yes, yes, standing ovation. There it is, as I broke the slit. Let's do that again. Yes, and there's, there's the, no, no, that slit doesn't want to work either. Yes, here we go, here we go, here we go. Boom, all right, fine. And that's your quickie cocktail, everybody. <laughs> In a hot mess. Another thing I don't think you can do without uh, when it comes to having a backyard party is have pizza. Yeah, it's all the rage. There's awesome pizza ovens out there. We're gonna use, I think, what is the easiest one in the world and the best one, an uni pizza oven in a bit, but we're gonna make homemade dough. And before you get scared, it's really basically four things. It's flour, it's salt, it's water, and it's yeast. That is it, and you can't screw it up, at least if you're using a stand mixer or not, in my case. So what we're gonna do is I went ahead and poured four cups, four and a half cups of double O flour. Not double O seven, 
double O flour. Um, this is a fine, fine, finely milled Italian flour that pizza purists swear by in Italy, not just for pizza, but for pasta. So we've got that in our stand mixer, um, but then we need to make the yeast water mixture. So right here, I have about one and a quarter cup lukewarm water. It's gotta be, for this to work, between 110 and 113 degrees. Um, that is the magic number. If it's too hot, it's gonna kill the yeast. So in a bowl, I have two teaspoons salt, and I'm gonna add the warm water, and then I'm gonna go ahead and add about seven grams of dried active yeast right there. And what's really easy to remember with this recipe is it's one packet, if you're gonna use like a brand like Red Star, just one packet. And then my little mini whisk, and we're gonna go ahead and whisk this all together. The reason why I'm using salt in this recipe is number one, this is Uni's dough recipe, and they are the masters. But um, we're using salt with this one because basically what salt does is it slows down the yeast fermentation, which means the slow and steady is going to um, inhibit the gluten. It's going to build a chewier crust, a more golden color of crust, and it's just gonna look really great. So once we have that all mixed in, it's still warm, we're gonna add this to our flour mixture uh, on the lowest setting. So you want your dough hook in place, put it on, stir, at least that's what my stand mixer says, and we're gonna add this in. And we're gonna just let this kinda do the job for about five to 10 minutes. We're gonna just let this stir and knead till the dough is kind of like sticky and stretchy all at the same time. All right, it's been almost 10 minutes and this is looking just perfectly done. See, this is what you want. I mean, the dough even sticks to the dough hook. Now all you're gonna do is remove this, have a separate bowl, put it in the bowl. I know a lot of people add a little oil to this. Uh, I find it unnecessary, so don't have to waste any ingredients. You're gonna wanna go ahead and cover this um, plastic wrap, towel, it doesn't matter but do keep it in a warm place because we're gonna let this prove for about one to two hours. Um, what we're essentially looking for is for the dough to double in size. So when your dough has doubled in size, you're going to go ahead and separate them into mini pizza size. So you could do three of the 16 inch pies or you can separate them into four different dough balls and make 12 inch pieces. So we're gonna do the 16 inch size because the Uni Coda 16 does 16 inch pies. So went ahead and separated some of them. When you separate them, you still need to let them sit about 20 minutes before you start stretching the dough. I get it, this can be completely intimidating. And I gotta say, don't be afraid. Just give yourself practice, okay? Don't think you're gonna hit a home run or a grand slam the first time you try this, but patience, acceptance that your pie doesn't have to be perfect at all. So lightly flour the surface that you're gonna do this in, uh, do this on. And the first thing you're gonna do is what's called the finger press. So I've kind of started slowly stretching this dough out. So all you wanna do is start kind of pressing the dough, moving out towards the edges until you can start opening it up and you just work that along. Now, if you ever get your dough to break up where you get a little hole and you can see through it, no big deal. All you have to do is pinch it back together. All right, after you kind of stretched it out into the size that you want, you're gonna go ahead and do the DJ deck. Yeah, this is where we need a little Run DMC or Beastie Boys music. What you're gonna do is just like a DJ, and Brian, a former DJ, right? You, you tell me if I'm wrong. And you're gonna go ahead and with your hands, you're gonna kind of just pull and move them away from each other, kind of like you're Thank you. You do it again, Brian? There we go. See, we're if you can't have fun in the kitchen, where can you have fun, right? Okay, and you just literally, here's a perfect example. I created a hole, pinch it back up, no harm, no foul. And once you're done playing DJ, now it's time for the steering wheel. And gang, I didn't make this up. This is the uni way of doing things. You're just gonna turn uh, your pizza dough like you're steering a car and you're gonna let gravity take over and literally let it hang like a curtain. And that's what's gonna give you this nice 16 inch pie. Yeah. All right, got this stretched out. We're ready to make our toppings. We're gonna grill some veggies in the uni. We're gonna make a little bit of a garlic sauce to go on top and a beautiful light salad because, well, it's Instagram worthy. 
So before we go uh, and fire out the pizza oven, I thought we should make a little nice crisp salad that's gonna go on top of the pizza first, and it's super simple. Salads should be good salads anyway. So get yourself a bag of your favorite greens. In this case, I have arugula, which I love because of the pepperiness. And then for a little kick on the salt, um, diced prosciutto is absolutely lovely. So add in maybe about a half cup's worth. Um, if you're going to do a larger pie. And then really, a salad, olive oil, uh, lemon juice, and some salt and pepper. It's just lovely, because this is not gonna compete with the amazing flavors of our grilled peppers and onions, the sauce that we're gonna make for the uni. You just want everything to kind of play with each other. And speaking of playing with each other, okay, we need to fill up the salt. <laughs> I am DJing, because, you know. I got skills now. Um, the other thing that I love is the crisp cold salad plays off of the warm hot pizza. So it's a real nice ju juxtaposition. Oh, thank you. And then some tongs for tossing. And that's it. That's all you need. And you can honestly like make a big batch and have leftovers for lunch the next day. This is a veggie pizza. Use what you have in your fridge. What I had is I took a red pepper, deseeded it, cut it into thin strips half of a white onion, again, thin strips, and then I took half an eggplant and diced it into about one inch pieces, a little bit of olive oil, some salt and pepper, and again, in the uni skillet, it's going into the oven, and we're gonna roast these babies for about five to eight minutes till they get a nice char. Oh, perfectly nice and charred. Now, be mindful, if you're using a regular gas grill or charcoal grill with grates, you don't want to slice up your onions and peppers unless you're going to use a skillet like this. Just cut them in half, leave them in large pieces, grill them, let them cool, then slice and dice. Slice and dice. Doesn't that sound good? Slice and dice. So now it's time to build the pizza. So what I did is took some mozzarella cheese, shredded it, and put a light layer over the top. Now I can come in with the grilled and roasted veggies. Again, the rule of thumb when doing a pizza, light toppings. If you put too much topping on a pizza, it's gonna just turn out soggy and not the experience you want. Plus, it will also stick to the peel and you'll have a hell of a time trying to get it off. So just a little bit. As long as every bite has a little inch of veg, then you know you're good. Again, keeping that border pristine for that beautiful crust. All right, now, again, topping it off with a little bit more mozzarella cheese. And if you can buy a fresh ball and grate it, it's gonna be better than buying the pre-bag stuff. It has, pre-bag has starches in it and additives to keep it from clumping. So this is really where you're gonna appreciate a true like pizzeria type flavor. And then finally, you want a little zing with some fresh parm over top. All right, just a little bit. The other tip here, don't spend a lot of time building your pizza ahead of time. You wanna do it right before you're gonna throw it in the oven again so it doesn't stick to the peel. All right. So here's the thing about this uni, all right? And what makes great pizza? A real hot oven. This baby will heat up to 950 degrees in about 20 minutes. It's instant gas ignition. It comes already put together out of the box, so I love that. It is really the easiest portable backyard pizza oven I've ever found. And this pizza is gonna cook in 60 seconds. There's an L-shaped flame, so the only thing we have to do is we have to turn it, you know, uh, halfway through the cooking process so all sides are just evenly charred. Ooh, you can see, look at how perfect this crust is. So that's why we turn it, because this side is done. And we can get, get the rest of the pizza ready to go. Practice with your peel, my friends. It is probably the thing that you'll have to get used to most outside of stretching dough. But once you get a hand for it, um, it's really great. And everybody's gonna have fun because you can, you know, have everybody make their own pizza, have a toppings bar. Um, and who doesn't love a good pizza in 103 degree heat? Oh, there we go, perfect. All right, so now just one final step of our white veggie pizza, and that is, again, that crisp, cool arugula salad that we made with the brochute. 
and it just, again, adds really pretty color. The coolness and the crispness of the salad just works really well with the hot, bubbly pizza that just came out. And there you have it, a perfect party appetizer backyard display. Pizza, Philly cheesesteak crostini, and of course, some watermelon rosé. Thanks so much for watching. If you want to see more recipes, definitely check me out on my social media, Savor It With Stacy on Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok, or my website, savoritwithstacy.com. And who knows, you may get special offers from some of the brands that you see in these videos. Till next time.